after the conference. So this morning's session, Diversity and Inclusion Equals Me and You, will be led by Lanika Mussolini. Lanika is the Director of Grants Development at Tri-County Technical College, where she develops fundable proposals, provides strategic direction for proposal development teams, and directs all sponsored projects administration. She has been in research administration for 19 years. Lanika is an award-winning diversity professional. And in addition to that, Lanika's research administration role, she is a champion for diversity, equity, and inclusion, and has served as the chair of NCURA's Presidential Task Force on Diversity and Inclusion, leading the organization to establish a diversity and inclusion select committee. Lanika serves as a senior diversity and inclusion advisor to the Executive Committee for NCURA Region 3 and is the Chair of the Region 3 Diversity and Initiative Committee. Moreover, she also leads the diversity and inclusion initiatives at her institution, where she developed the strategic framework for diversity, inclusion, equity, and access for the entire institution and led the project team to becoming a standing institutional committee. Lanika is a sought after speaker, speaking at conferences, symposiums, and legislative luncheons across the country. She has presented numerous NCURA sessions and workshops and finds great pleasure in engaging with people from around the world. Lanika has also authored several articles for the NCURA magazine and has been featured in several local magazines. Lanika is currently a, doct a doctoral candidate at Wingate University. Without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to a Region 3 gem, Lanika Mussolini. Lanika. Thank you, Celeste. We're living in a world where there is more boldness surrounding the injustices in America. From social to racial to political, it is all playing out right before our eyes. I believe that we can all agree that we have never ever experienced anything quite like we have in recent years, months, and days to be exact. And for the first time in history, people of all races and backgrounds came together as a collective voice to speak out against racial injustices in America. This is huge. We see the tide shifting. People are bolder, unafraid, and unapologetic. We must realize that an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. As research administrators, we have a position to ensure that our scientists and researchers are thinking outside of the box, being inclusive and remaining globally competitive. We also have a social responsibility to ensure profession filled with diverse professionals. As humans, we have a responsibility to all to do the right thing. And in the words of the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe nor political nor popular, but he or she must take it because conscience tells him or her it is right. Happy birthday, Dr. King. So good morning. And as Celeste introduced, I'm Lanika Mussolini, and I'm glad to serve as the first speaker for the last day of FRAC. I want to send out a huge congratulations to Jennifer, Celeste, Elizabeth, and the entire team for putting together an amazing week-long virtual event. So hand clap to you all. By the end of this session, I want you all to know that diversity and inclusion is all about me and you. And today, my hope is that you all will gain a broad understanding of the definition of diversity, inclusion, and equity learn the benefits of diverse, diversity, inclusion, and equity, gauge how to become self-aware of implicit bias, and acquire knowledge of how diversity, inclusion, and equity play a major role in advancing research and the sponsored programs division. Next slide, please. So what is diversity? Diversity is simply the similarities and differences that people have. When you think about race, gender, age, religion, 
sexual identification, abilities and disabilities, and the list can go on. We are all diverse. And when you think about inclusion, inclusion is the active, intentional, and ongoing engagement with diversity. And people usually get these mixed up sometimes, but they are different. Um, so when you think about inclusion, think about asking for input from people being affected by the actual decisions being made. Be welcoming, value, um, and respect, as well as leverage people's differences. And then of course, inviting and listening to different perspectives at the table. That is very, very important when you think about inclusion and when you do these things, you are actively engaging with the actual meaning of diversity. Next slide, please. This is one of my favorite diversity and inclusion quotes. Diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance. Now, I'm a dancer. I love to dance. And I tell you, there's absolutely nothing better than dancing the night away is the best thing. Next slide, please. So again, diversity is all the ways in which people differ. Inclusion is a variety of people having power, a voice, and decision-making authority. And then there's equity. Equity is the fair treatment, access, opportunity, and advancement for all people. But the caveat here is that one's identity cannot predict the outcome. Equality and equity are oftentimes used interchangeably, but they are not the same. I repeat, they are not the same. Equality is providing people with equal resources. Equity is providing people with the necessary resources that they need to be successful. People think that equality is enough, but it isn't. If your direct reports come from different backgrounds, they have different experiences and different abilities, one may not need the same things as the other to do their job efficiently. As leaders and managers, it is a responsibility for us to supply our people with what they need to do their job efficiently and effectively. This um, is very prevalent. Think about COVID and everything that happened surrounding COVID and people working from home. Many inequities were exposed during that time in trying to ensure that everyone had what they needed to continue performing their jobs and their roles remotely. Some people needed uh, laptops, some people needed um, cell phones or access to the, uh, the university phone system. Um, others may have needed um, a specific workspace or additional space at home. And then when you think about, uh, usually females are, are affected when you think about having to uh, teach your children from home because not only were we made to move into the household, but children were as well. They were pulled out of the schools so that they could continue to learn virtually. And so when you have all of this stuff going on, you really open your eyes and are able to see how people need different things in order to be successful. Next slide, please. Here's a photo of equality versus equity. Now there is a difference. Supplying these people with the same resources is just not beneficial for all. As you see, the, the young person in the wheelchair is not able to get on that box. So providing those equal resources is not beneficial for that person at all. However, when you supply them with the correct resources, it allows them all to meet their goal. And their goal is to be able to see the game in this photo. Next slide, please. So let's try this again. This is our reality in America, right? You have people who are have way more than they need. Then you have what I would refer to as the middle class who gets it from both ways, the upper class and the lower class. And then it all merges to the middle and the middle class suffers and you know we barely have enough to get by 
And then you have those on the lower end of things who are uh, not only do they not have what they need, but they are under-resourced. That's the reality that we face right now. Click it again, Elizabeth. Now here's the photo of equality. This is what equality looks like. It improves conditions for some, but not for all. Click again. Here's a photo of what equity looks like. Equity actually improves conditions for all, but there may still be some limitations. And one more time. And here's a photo of liberation. This is really what people desire, right? They want to be free to have the same experiences as others. And so, you know, when, you, when you're thinking about equity and uh, inclusion and access and all of those things, really people want to be free. They want to have what they need to be successful and to make it through life comfortably. So always remember these photos when you engage with equity and equality. Next slide, please. It is a fact that 70% of international ventures fail because of cultural differences. It is a fact that 90% of executives, thank you, from 68 countries believe cross-cultural management to be their top challenge. That is crazy. It is also a fact that 38% of companies offer cross-cultural education to their employees who are sent abroad. So what happens to the other 62% of people who are sent abroad? And it is a fact that 63% of assessed people have low motivation and interest to interact with other cultures. We have a problem with cultural competency. What is it about people that makes them so afraid of people who are not like them? We really need to fix this. Next slide, please. The goal is diversity of people and perspectives, equity in policy, practice, and position, and inclusion through power, voice, and organizational culture. Next slide, please. The National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health both have offices dedicated strictly to diversity and inclusion. There is too little diversity in science. Minorities are completely underrepresented in STEM, but NSF has an initiative to find ways to broaden participation of women, Hispanics, African Americans, and other minority groups in the US science and engineering workforce. Take a look at this chart. You'll see how, um, how this plays out in our workforce, what this looks like, who's making the decisions, who's coming up with the inventions. We are totally underrepresented in several areas when we look at this. And you just think about the number of females who are in the workforce. You know, it's also a fact that 60% of college graduates are females, but only 3% of them are um, executive leaders. That is crazy, totally underrepresented, and something needs to happen with that. If you look, um, this has to change. It just has to change. Whites are completely overachieving in this area up to 70%. And then you have Asians who come right behind that, but they're not even representing 20% of the population. And then Hispanics are behind them with about 12% there. And African-Americans are just at 10%. And when you think of other races, it's more like one to 2% represented in science and engineering fields. This has to change in order for us to produce the best research and science that's possible. Now let's give it up for Dr. Kismika Corbett, who played an instrumental role in developing the COVID-19 vaccine. I call this hashtag girl power. Next slide, please. 
When it comes to research, bias actually exists. We don't think about these things because we don't interact with them on a daily basis, but our PIs do. Uh, why? Because there's a largely homogeneous group leading the research. We just saw that in the chart. Some of the most well-known biases are listed here, confirmation bias, selection bias, outliers, overfitting and underfitting, and confounding variables. And real quickly, just to define those, confirmation bias is wanting to prove a predetermined assumption. And we all know that's wrong. Let the science lead us. Selection bias is when data is selected subjectively. Um, there's true representation of population that's null, right? So uh, this is where we come in as research administrators to help. And we'll talk about that shortly. Outliers are extreme data values used to determine an average. And when you have those results, that, is, um, they, that means it's way off the chart due to unusual circumstances. And so you may have like an average that's normal. And if anyone works in statistics or do plotting, you see uh, the dots around the line. But then if you look at the full chart, you may see dots at the bottom, way at the bottom or way at the top. And this is what we call outliers. So those should just be taken out to get a true average and representation of, of the smaller population, the sample population actually. Overfitting and underfitting gives an oversimplistic or overcomplicated picture of what reality is. And then confounding variables are outside the scope of the existing analytical model. And, and this is usually the third variable in a study that examines the potential cause and effect. But this is why it is important for our institutions and federal agencies to hold our PIs accountable to address any bias that may occur in research. Next slide, please. Speaking of accountability. Next slide, I'm sorry. Thank you. Speaking of accountability, I have two examples here. And these events really happen. First, there's the Tuskegee Airmen experiment where African-American males were told that they were getting free health care from the U.S. government, but instead were injected with syphilis and allowed it uh, to go untreated for long periods of time, like 20 to 40 years. Um, and that caused over 128 of those men to actually die from this disease. The scientists injected them with a disease and watched them die slowly because they failed to treat it. And along with their passing, a lot of them passed the disease on to their wives and their children. So for 40 years, public health officials engaged in unethical testing of black sharecroppers under the guise of offering them free medical treatment. But the men were never really given treatment, nor were they given health care. Next example is James Marion Simmons, who's known as the father of modern gynecology. However, he does not deserve that title at all. He actually performed gynecological studies on African-American females without consent or pain medication. He humiliated them, treated them like animals. Well, hmm, let me backtrack because we all know that people go wild if something happens to their animals or if their animals are mistreated. So I wouldn't even take it that far. It's something way less than that. And he performed these vow acts on their bodies, sometimes publicly, as you see the other gentlemen standing around in this photo. Horrible, horrible acts. These are the things that we have gone through in this country. Things have got to change, but we need to know how did we get here? We have to be honest about how we got here, right? Next slide. Now let's talk about um, exactly how, how we did get here. So it's by design. And one of the reasons I say is implicit bias. This design was created in our system. So it's systemic, it's a systemic issue. And then the indoctrination, 
when you think about the things that you see and that you hear on television, you see it in the media, on social media, you read it in the textbooks, you hear your parents talk and your friends around you, and all of this affects our thinking. A lot of times we don't even know that we're taking these things in. It's done unconsciously. Next slide. So yes, through our thinking, even when we do not know it, implicit bias is sneaky, but we see it play out in our everyday lives. It resides in our psyche and we do not know that these things are there until they begin to act themselves out. Implicit bias refers to the attitudes and the stereotypes that affect our understanding, our actions, and the decisions in an unconscious manner. These biases can be good or they can be bad, but they are activated involuntarily. Think about it. Why do you feel a certain way about certain people? Why do certain things make you angry? Why do you automatically gravitate towards others? It is because of the tiny seeds planted in our brains from childhood through adulthood. If we really reflect on why we have pet peeves and do not like people or feel some type of way about people, what would we find? When you see a black male in a hoodie, what do you automatically think of? When you see a Middle Eastern person in a head wrap, what do you think of? And if you hear of Mexicans and other Hispanics crossing the border, what do you think of? Think about all of the things that have been playing out in the media over the last years. I automatically get pictures in my mind and have thoughts when I think of these populations as well as other things. But this is these are some of the um, examples that people can think really quickly about how they feel about this population or people who look like this. When someone's wearing a hoodie or um, is of a different race and they're walking by your car, you hear the, the car automatically, the doors are locking. Like what is going on? And for safety, your door should have been locked in the first place. Next slide, please. Why does this happen? Why do we think this way? And how is this handled in the workplace? When I talk about DEI in front of live audiences, I generally get eye rolls. People automatically assume that diversity and inclusion is all about black and white, but it's so much broader than that. Yes, race is a huge portion of it, but what about gender and all of the, the injustices towards women in the workplace? What about ageism and all of the things that happen to either older people who are wanting to transition into a new role or take on new tasks at work? And what about younger people straight out of college who are going into the workforce? How are they treated? I can give you all types of examples, but DNI is a broad, broad subject. You see resistance all the time. People intentionally act to not conform or transform. They are okay with their stereotypes and their biases and they do not want to change. Then there's a lack of leadership buy-in when leaders are just apathetic. They could care less about what's going on and who's being affected. Then it's the hurry up and do something followed by improper implementation or what I refer to as box checking. I'm not a box checker, I'm all about action. So do not give me any tasks to check your boxes. And of course, there's a lack of education, which causes all of these things other um, that I have listed here. We have to be willing to learn from one another. And I always say, we are better together. Next slide, please. So what can happen if these things aren't corrected? There can be an oversaturation of similarity in homogeneity. Um, culture assimilation is always is also another biggie, and you probably see this in your offices. Uh, this results this this really can result in low retention and disengagement because people tend to kind of assimilate with the majority group. 
why not have your own mind and your own thinking? I think that's so much more sexy, right? That's the terminology this year. What you find in the dominant group is always deferred to for, for decision-making, for opportunities and promotions. Instead of thinking outside of the box and looking outside of the general group and giving new and different people a chance, there has to be some intentionality around all of this work or it's not going to work. The goal is for everyone to feel a sense of belonging so that they can bring their authentic selves to the office and engage with their full potential. But we have to become self-aware. Next slide, please. In order for us to overcome all of these things, we have to be self-aware. I cannot say that enough. People say, oh, well, I don't have bias. Um, you're not being honest with yourself. If you're human, you have biases. We all have them. You can't fix something unless you know that it's broken. I like to refer my clients and audiences to take the Harvard Implicit Association Test. It's offered free. You can Google it, it's online. Anyone can access it. But it's a, it's a proven tool and it helps you to recognize your own biases. They have several categories that you can select from. And if you want, you can take all of the tests. If you wanna know who you are and you want to be better, then you want to be self-aware. That's the first thing to do. Learn what your biases are, then work towards fixing those biases. But you have to be intentional about eliminating those biases and you have to be intentional about thoughtfulness of others. Then perform daily reflection and make adjustments. Reflection is always a time of learning. When you think back on what you've done for the day or how you thought about things throughout the day, even if you didn't act on those things, what were you thinking in your mind and how can you change that thinking to be a better person? Next slide, please. Why does diversity matter in research? Because of science and innovation depends on it. Everything that our PIs are doing depends on diversity in their research. Think about it. Let's go back to the COVID vaccine. Researchers needed subjects from all populations to be involved in order to produce the best product possible that worked for all people. This is true for all of our PIs research, you all. Even if they're not producing medicine, you have to think outside of the box. You have to think about bringing in diverse subjects and and uh, including people that you wouldn't normally think about. Next slide, please. What have we learned because of diversity in research? First, diversity in research is becoming increasingly important as the population becomes increasingly diverse. For the first time ever, students in school who are five years old now are not a majority. So 50.2% of the children who are in kindergarten, between those children, there is no majority race. So that tells us within the next 10 to 15 years, our demographics in this nation is gonna look totally different. How do we address that? How do we uh, navigate around that? How do we conform and transform to make this place more livable and better for everyone, for our science to flourish, for our researchers to think more broadly about their research. Research needs to be geared toward the populations they aim to help. And as the population changes, research and researchers have to change with it. Next slide, please. How can science benefit from diversity and inclusion? It has been proven that scientific progress relies on problem solving and collaboration. Groups that are composed of people with diverse experiences and areas of expertise tend to be more creative and innovative. MIT did a study, this is true. Asking questions drive science forward and scientists with different perspectives often ask different questions. 
think about it. I love when I'm working with a group of people. I can have really thought this thing out, right? Whatever we're working on, any issues. I've thought about it. I've gone through it. I've written it down. And as soon as I introduce it, people in my group start to ask other questions. And my brain starts turning like, oh, wow, yes, that's great. That's a, that's a wonderful idea. Yes, maybe we do need to approach it from this way. But that's how diversity works. It allows us to be our best selves. We have to ask different questions. We have to look at things differently because it leads to new insights. The ways in which scientists seek answers to questions can be heavily influenced by their values and new techniques often lead to new knowledge. And this is what we need. As a nation, we have to remain globally competitive. Next slide, please. But what can you do as research administrators? Consider bias during the pre-award phase, right? You work with your uh, PIs on sometimes, if you, get, if you get the proposal in time, you work with your PIs on developing those proposals and developing those budgets and reviewing um, the actual application and the, the uh, statement of work, right? So ask questions during the proposal development and budget development phases to help eliminate barriers. Are marginalized groups being excluded? Does this create bias in access? Do policies unintentionally exclude people? These are all really good questions to ask and have at the front of your brain when you're going over uh, the proposals and the, the plan with your PIs. And especially if you work in research and proposal development, you should be asking these questions. Know your PI's research and what their, who their target population is and how they plan to recruit from that population. There could be barriers. And you as an outside person can think differently about how the PIs can better serve and recruit that population. And then consider barriers during the post-award phase as well. You want to ensure access. When you think about the methods of participant support payments, are you wanting to give checks? Are you wanting to do uh, EFTs, electronic funds transfers? If so, how does that impact the groups that are participating. They may not have bank accounts. They may not have a fixed address. So how can they receive a check? How can they get a deposit into a bank account if they don't even have you know, a bank account or a debit card or any of that information? They may not have made it that far in life yet. We want to ensure access and that we're not being um, unduly when providing these services. So what ways are we recruiting these participants? Do we need to have a translator in the mix to help um, recruit those participants? What do our recruiters look like? Do they look like the population that's being recruited for the research? You know, considering language barriers, transportation barriers and other issues. And if we go back to COVID and all of the inequities that's been um, uncovered over this last year, you see a lot of this. How are our elderly getting to the doctor? A lot of them don't know how to do the virtual visits. They're not technologically savvy. So barriers have been created um, that seems like a good thing for the general population, but we are really, really missing out on things that would be caught if we were um, going at our normal uh, schedule and routine. But times are changing. Times are not like they were before. Next slide, please. So how do you make an institution more diverse? Do your part. Um, think about diversity on graduate admissions committee if you work for a graduate school. You can have a voice there. Combat implicit bias based on race and gender. Realize that implicit bias exists and diversity has to be intentional and deliberate. The established norm narrows diversity to social engineering. So you need to track your data so that you can see where you're kind of you know, lacking where your gaps are. Create career pathways for underserved minorities at universities and nonprofit research institutes. Broaden your talent pools to get diverse ca uh, candidates. 
Does everyone in your office look like you? Are they from the same type background, same type education? You may wanna think about changing that up some, invite other people to the table, but institutions can reward recruitment of diversity. I love this photo here. Uh, the gentleman says, why don't we have any fresh ideas around here, but they all look the same, right? They all think alike. You have to add some diversity in there to get new and fresh ideas. Next slide. Some suggestions for promoting diversity at your institution systematically. Think about your hiring and promotion procedures and policies. Check them for equitable language. Be transparent, collect and publicize aggregated diversity metrics. You can have a voice in this, especially when it comes to um, your research, um, your research office. I know some institutions have it where it's just a full division. Some are broken out. You know, even that in itself is diversity, having, having research administrators at the department level, the college level, the central office level, and the various uh, positions in which they hold. But is there diversity within that diversity? We want to make sure that we are doing the best that we can. So commit to resources and provide diversity tools to divisions and departments. And then evaluate impact and adjust strategy if necessary. If you are a manager or a leader in your division and you're responsible for making policies, it is up to you to ensure that those policies have equity, equitable language there and that you're not writing those policies in a way to exclude people. Next slide, please. We all know because of the changing demographics that the face of research administration is changing, you all, it's changing. I love this picture here. Uh, this was in CURA annual meeting a couple years ago and we had Dr. Freeman Herbowski as our lunch keynote. And man, he was phenomenal. He was our opening keynote, sorry. He was phenomenal. But these uh, people in this photo are people from the National um, Diversity and Inclusion Task Force. Amazing group of people. But the face of research is changing. So the face of research administrators also need to change. Next slide, please. We can become stronger organizations by better defining diversity and inclusion as it applies to research, accounting for the regulatory and funding environments in which we operate, as well as the uniqueness of our institution and our varying locations. I don't know if you know, but if you're a research administrator, you have superpowers and you are amazing. And so, you know, if you're anything like me, I'm, I'm very high energy and I like to be engaged, but that's one of the things we want to do with diversity and inclusion. You want to ensure that you have an engaged and high performing culture. Next slide. A diverse workforce can capture a greater share of dynamic approaches to problem solving. Recruiting from a diverse pool of candidates means a more qualified, workforce. And these are things that we have to think of, and especially if you're in charge of hiring. Who are you hiring? What are you looking for? What does your hiring team look like? And it's always a good idea if you're wanting to increase diversity in your office, it's always a good idea to maybe do um, a blind review of the candidate applications and resumes. And that way you can ensure that the resumes and the applications are being judged fairly before you even get to the interview phase. Create a rubric so that people are being scored, but make sure that you have diverse people on the interviewing team so that those candidates who come in have a fair chance at being selected. Because just like with research bias, there's also hiring bias. And I don't know if you know it or not, but research has shown that the research administration field is made up 70% white female with college degrees from, you know, two parent households and they're in their, um, from ages 55, 45 to 55. 
And so these people may, they'll be retiring within the next 10 to 20 years. And so we do know that research administration is gonna be changing the way that we do things, the way that we're recruiting people, all of that's gonna change. It has to change with the time. So what are we doing to ensure that we're doing our part? Next slide, please. Organizations with strong diversity climates are likely to have teams with increased job satisfaction and knowledge sharing. There's nothing like being in a room with a group of smart people and everyone's thinking out loud and developing all of these new and innovative ideas to share with one another, to, to share with the research administration community and with your institutions. It's the most amazing thing. I, my goal when I wake up in the mornings is to learn something new every day. And I'm a talker, so it's not hard for me to network or meet new people. I love meeting new people. I love learning about their cultures and their backgrounds. I love learning about what other research administrators are doing at their institutions. And so we have to fix our mind on those type things. Think about it. When you reflect daily, what have you done during that day to impact diversity, equity, inclusion? What have you done during that day to make this world a better place? Next slide. And in the words of Rosie the Riveter, we all can do it. That concludes my presentation. Thank you all so much for your time um, and for allowing me to be with you on today. I think Jennifer has, or Celeste has questions. Thank you, Lanika. Uh, we have a question from uh, David Brunel. Uh, how do we get our PIs to not be upset, angry, or bothered when we probe these questions in pre-award or post-award? Stated differently, sometimes the okay, PI so, is not so, so welcoming of the RA input. So mm -hmm. this is a bit of a general question, but if we were being called on to probe these questions as outsiders, we might have to ask hard questions. That is true. And you know what? I always tell people to do this work with boldness, right? But we have to be respectful. And my thing is relationship building. It's all about building relationships with your PIs, knowing who they are, what buttons to push, how they operate. But we all know that when you get to know someone, they respond differently. And so I would first say, begin to develop relationships with your PIs, get to know them and let them get to know you and feel like approaching you is safe. And so when you start to have these conversations, it doesn't come off as I'm trying to change your research. It rather comes off as I'm trying to improve and enhance your research. I'm trying to help you make your proposal more competitive. Are there any other Thank questions? Thank you for that question. Any additional questions? I had a I had a question about the um, data that you shared about um, uh, research administration, and uh, mm -hmm. I I think you spearheaded the Region Three uh, survey. Is that where your uh, data came from? Climate survey. Yes. Yes. Okay. No, actually, that information came from two thousand and seventeen. Um, from the profile data from Incura. Okay, so that's that is um, people that can afford an Incura membership. So I think um, true. You know, a lot of times there is um, a lack of diversity. I think in some of our profession. This is my opinion. In some of our professional societies. Abs no, you're absolutely right. Those those memberships don't always go to the individual contributors, um, they go to the people who are um, yeah, in a most favored status uh, for because they're expensive. And so it may be only the mm -hmm. direct 
only the assistant director or only uh, you know the higher level folks that are, are able to do that, which also speaks to uh, promotion uh, opportunities as well. That is true. That is true, Jennifer. And I'm glad you brought that up. Um, if you're, well, you don't even have to be a member of Vincura, but one of the things that we just did on January 5th was launch the National Climate Survey um, for, we sent it out to 40,000 research administrators. So just people in the field that's on the, the listserv, it's not just for Incura internally. And we're collecting some of this demographics data as well as learning about research administration as a whole and how we see the profession as well as um, how people's views in Cura, right? So mm -hmm. we know that it's expensive for people to join. We know that it's expensive for people to attend and participate in conferences, but what can we do about that so that we're training the entire profession and not just focusing on people who can afford it? Because if we're honest, that's another barrier, right? You've mm -hmm. created this to where a certain population can be members of this organization. Something needs to change about that. And I love the RASPERS data. I always love seeing that because it just makes so, so much sense when you think about um, belonging and how people really feel in their, their uh, roles, in their current jobs, how they feel about the occupation, if they're being marginalized, if they're being... Um, picked on or looked at a certain way because of their level of education or because of their role within the institution. All of these things matter, right? And those are the various ways that we can look at diversity, equity, and inclusion and figure out a strategy to address those things. Thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Oh, here's another another question. Okay. Uh, has diversity and inclusion changed over your career? And have you seen any substantial progress? It has changed. Um, I've actually changed institutions. I started doing research administration at Clemson University um, 19 years ago. It's been a long time. Um, but I have been at my current institution for almost nine years now. And so the culture at those institutions are completely different. Um, you have a large um, level one, I believe is what it's called, um, institution, research institution. And then you have my smaller institution where I am now, where I pretty much do everything from, you know, cradle almost to grave. I do have some post-award accountants that I work with, but I do a lot of the uh, post-award reporting. And so my role has changed. I came from an institution where, you know, we have research administrators at the department level, the college level, the central level, and all over. And so your task and your duties are completely different. The faculty and PIs that you deal with are completely different um, to a, a place where the culture is just, it's different. And so when I look at uh, research administration from where I come from, there was not a lot of diversity amongst research administrators. And another thing really, you know, not just focusing on race, but what about gender? There are not a whole lot of males in research administration. And usually when you see males in research administration, it's at the upper levels of research administration. So how, what are we doing? in our recruiting to where we're not attracting um, all types of people. Right, right. So that's a comment um, that came out the, um, uh, when we sent out the article in the Encura Magazine on the RASPERS data that um, there is a, a, and we didn't look at gender, that was, that was not the focus of that, of that uh, study. But there is a huge gender gap, and um, yes, and and I think that um, you know, as a profession that's more than eighty percent women, uh, we need to be conscious of what we're saying and how we're saying it uh, with our male colleagues, and not be right. 
I mean, uh, but more than likely, I'm making a generalization, we've all experienced some insensitivity, but we need to make sure that we're not guilty of the same thing and in being insensitive right. uh, to our male counterparts. Mm -hmm. And also, yeah. um, I loved your comment about, um, you know, uh, the hiring practices, making sure that we've got a, a search committee that looks as diverse as possible or that is as diverse as possible because mm -hmm. uh, for those of us that have ever gone into a room where we are other than the rest of the people in the room, you're not going to be as much on your game as you would be right. or other people in the room that you feel a connection to. So Yes, right. And that's what I was going to say. As humans, we connect with people. And if you feel so much comfortable if you can connect with someone in that space. I love that. And another thing, uh, Jennifer, just thinking about our faculty members and the PIs that's doing the research, that has changed. That has changed. And so when you think about us communicating with our PIs and faculty members, what are the cultural barriers there? What, what are the differences where um, you know we could have a diverse pool of research administrators who are able to work with PIs who look like them, who are from the same culture, who can relate and understand. Because I've had situations where there were some real cultural barriers, and I was looked down upon because you know I was the black female with a master's degree. What do I know? Right. And people really have that attitude because of their biases, right? but I know what I know and you know what you know. So let's keep it at that. <laughs> yes. Well, I tell you, as a, as a woman that's worked in the profession for over 35 years with a deep Southern accent, um, it's some, right. I have a, a t-shirt that says underestimate me. It will be fine. <laughs> we, <laughs> bless your heart. Yes, right? bless my heart. <laughs> <laughs> we we uh, want to make sure that uh, diversity doesn't mean, okay, we've got a room full of people that look different now, but if they express themselves, right. they've got to be part of the echo chamber. They all think alike, right? Yeah. So a diversity yeah. means, as you were describing, when you, when you bring your idea, someone asks a question mm -hmm. to think of. You know, and that's not a challenge in a bad way. That's a challenge in a good way because we're all so much stronger. It is. Uh, Brenda Jackson asked a great question. She wanted to, uh, okay. for uh, what other resources we might go to for uh, more on the topic of uh, diversity and inclusion. So um, there are lots of, um, resources out there online. But I will say one of the things that I've done as chair of the um, Presidential Task Force on Diversity and Inclusion, my team and I have developed a 2021 Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion webinar series. Um, the, the recording, the actual event itself is for NCURE members. However, we're recording and we're making those videos available on YouTube for the general public. And so we had our first one on unconscious bias on uh, January 7th. That one is now out on YouTube. And so you can look for that on the Incura channel. And we have five more sessions within that series that we're going to um, air through, throughout this year. And so we'll have one every other month going through November. And we touch on different topics within diversity, equity, and inclusion. Well, I, I encourage everyone to partake in that uh, because those those webinars, if you uh, purchase it for your institution, you can share it. With, you don't have to buy one for each person. You can share those. And Cura is it's free. This one's free. Oh, okay, okay. That might, you can't get more. Yes, we're we're <laughs> offering the diversity ones for free. Yes. Oh, that's great. That's that great. was important. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, we definitely will be taking part in that and I encourage others to do so as well. And to, uh, as, you, as you pointed out, look at Encura TV 
on YouTube because mm -hmm. there's always a lot of great resources there. Well, we're coming down to our, yeah. our uh, final minutes. Um, and I, I, I want to thank you again. Celeste, I, I jumped in and started talking. I want you to close us out. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> All right. Well, this concludes our session on diversity and inclusion equals me and you. I want to thank everyone for participating. Lanika, thank you so much for this very informative and thought-provoking and powerful thank presentation on such an important topic. Uh, we really, I think we all really uh, enjoyed it and it gave us a lot to think about. Um, if anyone has any additional questions, uh, please feel free to send them to our presenter.